According to NASA, no conclusive evidence of advanced life has been discovered. However, it has conducted numerous missions and projects to search for signs of life beyond Earth. NASA's Planetary Defense Program is designed to detect and mitigate potential threats from near-Earth objects such as asteroids and comets that may collide with Earth. However, every now and then, this defense system detects something out of the ordinary. And this is exactly what happened when it recorded another sighting of an object known as the Ezekiel Wheel. The Book of Ezekiel claims to be the words of Ezekiel Ben Buzi, a priest living in exile in Babylon between 593 and 571 BC. Ezekiel, a prophet, describes a flying chariot in his book. It was powered by angels and had wheels within wheels. Of course, some scholars disagree with the verse's interpretation. Others, however, believe it refers to visitors from other worlds. The exact reference to Ezekiel's wheel appears in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 15 to 21, which says, quote, As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would rise along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. UFO believers attribute the text to the premise that ancient peoples were unable to explain their surroundings. As a result of their attempt at explanation, we get superstitions, legends, and myths. The story of the Cyclops, for example, appears to have begun with the discovery of a rhinoceros skull, people mistook the horn's opening for a third eye. As a result of the explanation for the indentation, a story developed. NASA's Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, or STEREO, captured a glimpse of a wheel-like structure in late February 2020. The object's size and path across the sun led observers to believe that the observatory had captured an alien craft. Not everyone, however, agreed that it was Ezekiel's wheel. According to UFO researcher Scott Brando, what people saw were reflections. He said it was a recurring image artifact used by internal reflections of a planet, and NASA responded in an unprecedented move, saying that the strange-looking geometrical object within the telescope optics is actually an internal reflection of the planet Venus, and that this effect has been observed numerous times before. NASA's explanation makes sense and disproves the biblical flying chariot. What we don't know is what Ezekiel did see. He had a large vocabulary and accurately described other images he saw, is it possible that Ezekiel saw aliens in strange spacecraft? Or did he see angels on wheels flying above him? We may never find out. But what we do know is stars are powered for the majority of their lives by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Fusion is accomplished through two distinct processes. The proton-proton or PP chain, which accounts for 99% of the sun's energy, begins with the fusion of two protons in solar plasma to form deuterium as an intermediate. The other, known as the CNO cycle, comprises a set of reactions in which four hydrogen nuclei ultimately combine to form four helium, with carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen as catalysts. The relative importance of the two mechanisms depends mostly on the stellar mass and on the metallicity, or the abundance of elements in the core, that are heavier than helium. Because the CNO cycle is dependent on heavy elements, the flux of neutrinos in the solar core scales with the abundance of metals. And because of the scaling, the flux can be used to determine the chemical composition of the sun at the time of its formation. Neutrinos, on the other hand, are extremely difficult to detect. Although 700 million CNO cycle neutrinos pass through a square centimeter of Earth per second, their mean free path through rocky matter is about a light year. The Borexino detector, located 3 kilometers beneath the Apennines at Italy's Gran Sasso National Laboratory, has now detected those CNO neutrinos for the first time. To find them, a team of nearly 100 scientists look for flashes of light caused by neutrinos scattering from electrons in 780 tons of petroleum-based scintillator. The count rate was determined to be a handful. 
The ability to distinguish CNO neutrinos from other solar neutrinos and low-energy radioactive contaminants, whose decays produce light flashes in the same energy window, was critical to the achievement. In 2014, the collaboration measured the flux of PP neutrinos and spent years purifying the scintillator liquid. They launched yet another years-long search for the far fewer CNO neutrinos. To capture those few elusive particles, the innermost volume of the scintillator must be as free of temperature fluctuations, and thus convection currents, as possible. To that end, the collaboration wrapped the detector in a massive wool blanket and installed a new air conditioning system in the same room in 2015. These advancements reduced the drift of the detector's worst background contaminant, bismuth-210, to a mere 20 cm per month, relatively far from the inner volume. The 210 bismuth is produced by the breakdown of lead-210, which is concentrated on the vessel wall containing the scintillator. What this means is, unfortunately, the new determined flux of CNO neutrinos was insufficiently precise to determine the abundance of metals in the sun's core. Previous measurements of the sun's helioseismology indicate a metal-rich core, whereas photoabsorption measurements indicate a metal-poor core. Speaking of the sun's signals, astronomers are receiving mixed signals from Saturn. Radio signals, that is. NASA's Cassini spacecraft recently discovered that the natural radio wave signals emitted by Saturn differ in the northern and southern hemispheres, a distinction that could affect how scientists calculate the length of a Saturn day. But the strangeness doesn't stop there, according to researchers. The signal variations, which are controlled by the rotation of the planet, also change dramatically over time, appearing to be in sync with the Saturnian seasons. Saturn produces natural radio waves known as Saturn Kilometric Radiation, or SKR. While these waves are inaudible to human ears, they sound to Cassini like bursts of a spinning air raid siren and vary with the planet's rotation. Cassini scientists converted Saturn's varying radio wave emissions to human audio range. Observations of this type of radio wave pattern at Jupiter allowed scientists to calculate the planet's rotation rate, but the situation at Saturn has proven to be much more complicated, according to the researchers. When NASA's Voyager spacecraft visited Saturn in the early 1980s, its SKR emissions indicated that one Saturn day lasted approximately 10.66 hours. However, subsequent observations by other spacecraft, including the NASA European Space Agency Ulysses Probe and Cassini, revealed that the radio burst varied by seconds to minutes. Other Cassini observations revealed that the SKR emissions were not a single event. They're a duet, but the planet's two singers are out of tune. According to researchers, radio waves from near Saturn's North Pole had a period of around 10.6 hours, while those from near Saturn's South Pole repeated every 10.8 hours. The situation has then become even more bizarre. Gurnett and his colleagues published a paper in December using Cassini data to show that the southern and northern SKR periods crossed over in March 2010. That is, the southern period gradually decreased while the northern period increased, eventually converging at around 10.67 hours last March. This occurred seven months after Saturn's spring equinox in August 2009, when the sun shone directly over the planet's equator. The pattern has continued since the crossover, with the period of the southern SKR emissions decreasing and that of northern ones increasing. With the rate technology is advancing, it's interesting to think of all the discoveries that humanity is yet to come across.